want you to take your Bible, if you would please, and turn with me into the Old Testament to a very familiar verse of Scripture. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14. I come to you with a word of hope this morning and a word of encouragement. Here's the topic, how God heals a broken land, a broken nation. How God heals a broken nation. If you were to read, and some of you probably have, recent surveys of public opinion in the United States, you would find that a majority of the polls show a majority of Americans deeply bothered, deeply troubled that our country is headed in the wrong direction. I noticed um, one of the headlines and one of the news feeds that I get even this morning was saying that a 100-year-old World War II veteran, one of the last remaining ones alive, broke down as he described his disappointment in what America has become. He's saying it is not the nation that our boys went and bled and died for. I don't believe that there would be a serious debate among those of us gathered together this morning in this setting who would try to argue that, oh no, oh no, uh, America is not a broken nation. We are doing just fine. The truth of the matter is, the scripture is very clear. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. That where there is a turning away from God, there is going to be disarray, there is going to be decay, and there is going to in time be defeat. So you say, Pastor, well, where is the word of encouragement this morning? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. It starts with this. Second Chronicles 7, verses 13 and 14. The Lord says, if I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locust to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. How does God heal a broken nation? He heals a broken nation by starting with his people in that broken nation. It's going to be the clearing up, the restoring of the relationship between God and his people in that nation. It's not going to primarily be the politician. It's not going to primarily be the financiers. It's not going to be primarily be the educators. It will come down to the deepening, the igniting of a further fire of relationship between Father God and His people. Across the history of the church, that has been the case, where the Lord has found a persecuted group of his people, and his people cry out to him, Lord, we are yours, we belong to you, we want our lives to honor you, 
Have mercy on us. Defend us. Rescue us. Deliver us. That your name may be praised. That was true in the first century when the Jewish religious system in their power and influence turned against the early church. Persecutions happened. Deaths happened. As that century went on, the Romans entered the fray with, with great passion. They blamed, Nero blamed the burning of the imperial city of Rome on the Christians uh, historians believe in order that he might burn down the old Rome and build up Neropolis, build one in his name, but he turned on the believers, and more than likely that was the time when the apostle Paul was martyred and many, many others. But here's the rest of the story about Rome. It wasn't until the 4th century A.D., the 300s, that the Roman Empire had become so weakened militarily, socially, politically, that the, the, the hordes from the north, uh, the, the, the Goths from the north, out of Germany and parts of Europe, began to invade successfully what had been an unbreachable empire, Rome itself. But what had been going on during those three centuries were the prayers of God's people. They weren't necessarily saying, Lord, get us out of here, change our street address. But they were found faithful praying, Lord, be glorified in our bodies, be magnified in our bodies, whether by life or by death. Paul prayed in Philippians 1. And many of them were put to death on the altar of entertainment. The the, the Roman leadership would hold these large games and they would take the Christians and this is not just this is not just supposed history this there's actual verifiable fact that this happened they would bring the Christians families separated individuals but they would not say Caesar is Lord their confession was Jesus is Lord And they wouldn't back away from that. And as a result of it, they were brought in and made sport of. Animals were turned loose against them. Gladiators were turned loose against them. And they were slaughtered. They were were killed. But the amazing thing during all of that time is that as they continued to pray and as they continued to suffer, something began to happen in the minds of the Roman citizens who were invited to come to these games to see the the carnage against the Christians. As the ones in the the arenas would, would watch these believers, they would come into the arenas holding hands and singing praises. Some of them with their hands lifted up, with their eyes toward heaven as they were about to face death. And there was such a stunning way in which these, these Christians faced death, suffering, brutality like seldom had it ever been experienced in human history, that it began to turn the Roman population against the Roman leaders to say, this isn't right. What's wrong with these people? What could be so bad about these ones filled with such joy and with such seeming innocence that you would want to put them to death? They prayed, they suffered, but they watched in time the Lord. Now, this this is incredible. This is incredible. It took 300 years to get here, but here's where it ended. It's a man by the name of Constantine who some way or another ended up as the Roman emperor. Well, the amazing thing about that is his mother was a believer. (laughs) His mother was a Christian, praying for her son. And when the the tide of of the Roman population began to, had turned against the, the leadership for the persecution of Christians, and Constantine has his own mother who is a believer, he just decided that Rome needed to become Christian. 
And so without realizing how it truly works, he on one day all the Roman legions were pagan, but he announced at the beginning of the next day that there are going to be some Christian priests to stand up in front of those Roman legions with branches dipped in water. And as the, as the Roman legions marched under it, they were going to be drip, flinging that water on them and baptizing them. So what they ended up being, they were pagan unbaptized, and now the next day they were pagan baptized. But the shift came, even though there was no real conversion and so forth of those kinds of, at that point in time, the shift came to the Roman Empire that it, 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 it changed to, its name changed to the Holy Roman Empire. The very ones that Rome sought to smother, to crush, to remove were the very ones who over a period of time, as the people prayed and cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, the Lord defeated the most powerful empire the world had ever seen up until that time in answer to the prayers, listen to me, in answer to the prayers of his people. Folks, all of history is his story. And at the heart of the story from the Father's heart is his people. Persecution. We, we have a connection with what happened in Romania um, and the overthrow of communism by way of our, our brother Sammy Tippett, who regularly preached there under Ceausescu, had to slip in and slip out. But there was this amazing revival going on in the underground church. In Romania, we, you, you are aware of that story. But, and, and what happened, again, this is, this is an indicator of how God deals with nations on the basis of his dealing with his people. The cries of the, Amer of, of the Romanian church went up and they were, they, they were meeting in houses and under trees and out by creek banks and in buildings that they could, where they could find them. But they were, they were horribly mistreated, but they just kept praying. They just kept praying. And the day finally came when, when Ceausescu's security forces surrounded one particular church and with, with its people there and with the children there. And they would go after the pastors. And so in this particular setting, the pastor was standing there surrounded by the children of the church. Ceausescu's forces came up and with machine guns, killed everyone. I mowed down the children, mowed down the pastor. And it was at that point in time, and that, as that word spread across the nation, that, the, that the, 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 the houses emptied, the businesses emptied. They were in or out on the streets. They were protesting a, a revolution without arms because they had no weapons. But they were, it is enough. This is enough. This is enough. The military turned on Ceausescu, arrested him, he and his family, but he and his wife in particular, were, were, were put to death. And, and it all ended, and the, and the people in Romania, Sammy can tell this so much better than I can, but the people erupted in the streets all over the nation. There is a God. There is a God. There is a God. In a nation where they had grown up being taught there is no God. Atheism was the order of the day. And in an instant, it was turned around. It was changed in answer to the cries of God's people to the Father. Folks, listen, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there are stories that some of you could tell, not about a nation being changed, but about a family line being revolutionized, being rescued, and being set free. Because you found yourself in that place, burdened for the shape that your family line was in. And wanting the curse of whatever it would be, the lie of the enemy that, that found that vulnerable hole, that vulnerable place within the family line. And you, in, in so many words, were saying back to the Lord, Lord, let it stop with me. Let it stop with me. It goes no further. I'm your child. I'm asking you to rescue me, my family line. And you've seen that happen. When God gets ready to heal a broken nation. It will be about his relationship 
with his people. So many stories, so many instances, even in our relatively short American history, of that being a specific and documentable truth. It wasn't about the persecuted American church, but it could be about the American church that had just gotten sleepy, that had just, had just gotten used to, start to things being turned in a direction that weren't pleasing to the Lord, and instead of rising up, just, just backed away, backed away, backed away. In 1857, a financial collapse came upon the Wall Streets and the, 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 the financial markets across the nation. It, it, was a, it was a desperate time financially. And the Lord will so often use circumstances, difficult circumstances, to wake His church up. And, and I, that's my word of hope <laughs> I believe the desperation of the situation that we're in across this nation and in the cities and so many parts of our, of our land, it is a, it, the good news is that the Lord is using the desperate nature situation that America is in right now to awaken His church. I believe that there are tens of millions of American Christians, ones who truly know Jesus as Savior and Lord, who are, being, who are being awakened by the depth of the depravity from the White House all the way to the lowest parts of our leadership. Not that in every case, with every life, every elected official, that would be the case. But it can seem as if the whole, the whole movement is in the direction away from God and away from what the standards are that he says are life and will be life for civilization. The more we hear about that, we have the option of just giving up, just crawling under a, under a rug and just being a bump on the floor and waiting for it to somehow blow over. We can just give up. Or we can, we can realize that the Lord uses these desperate times to call His people to seek His face and to, to freshly ignite the union between us on this earth and our Father and our Savior in heaven. And we begin to pray, Lord, your will, your will on this earth like it is in heaven. And we pray that aggressively. We pray that tenaciously. And in time, something happens. 1857 was a season of financial collapse. And in New York City, there was a young Presbyterian preacher, wannabe, he wasn't even, I don't think, fully ordained. He was, he, was, he was a layman, but he had a heart for prayer, and he had a heart for his city. And so he, this is a well-documented story of how he passed out a few flyers to invite folks to come just to pray. Because there were, there were things economically going on in the nation that were putting a strain on everything. And they were, they were causing those, those New York um, financiers to, to, to grow deeply concerned and troubled. And what's coming next? And are we going into a, into, a, into a complete downturn, never to be returned, losing everything that we've had? Because of that, people were willing to pray. They were, they were ready to cry out for help, realizing that the natural source, the resources were failing them. And so he, he sent those invitations out. A few folks came, the first announcement. They came, now he announced it again, and another week or so, a few more came. And then the next week, that, that kind of multiplied again. But by the end of just a few weeks, several weeks as a matter of fact, they were... They, they, they got, it was, it was making such news in downtown New York City because so many businessmen were leaving their offices and leaving the stock market area and going to the churches to pray from 12 to 1 in New York City. They started sending reporters around to count how many businessmen were in the churches in downtown New York City. And at one point they counted over 10,000 businessmen on their knees praying at the noon hour, 1857, that it, it spread to Chicago, it, it spread farther west to Denver, moved into other areas and regions, and the Lord brought this incredible, without a preacher, without a central preacher, 
with, without a bunch of money thrown at it and a bunch of publicity. It was just by word of mouth, but it was by the stirring of the hearts in the, in the hearts of God's people. That, that there would be stories told where a, a, a wife would show up at one of those business, at one of those prayer meetings, and, and she would be given the opportunity to pray. And she would start praying for her husband, wouldn't call his name out, but just would pray, Lord, bring my husband home, save his soul, rescue him. Our family needs that, have mercy. And the prayer meeting would go on. And then on toward the end of it, there was a, somebody would stand up, a man would stand up on the other side of the auditorium and say, I'm that husband. I'm that husband. And I'm coming back to the Lord and I'm giving my heart to Jesus and I want to go home. And mothers showing up praying for sons and the same kinds of things would happen. Folks, listen. And, and a great awakening, a great stirring, it's called the 1857 Prayer Revival. It came just a few short years before the Civil War. The Civil War broke out in 1861. This was, this was 1857. And, and great was the divide in the nation over the issue of slaveholding states and slave-free states. In the northern tier of nations, the concern coming out of the 1857 revival, though it, already, it had roots prior to that time, but it just, it, it, was, it had gasoline poured on it, this thing of the, that people are to be free in this land, regardless of skin color, regardless of place of origin, people need to be free. And so when it came time to literally lay down their lives for the freedom of those enslaved, there were, there were many soldiers, young men who became soldiers, and that was, that was what they were determined to do, many of them as a point of conviction from a fresh heart worked by the Spirit that it's worth laying my life down for someone else in order that someone else may be free. It's estimated that over 300,000 young men from the north in the Civil War were killed in that battle. But Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote, wrote the, the, the song, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. That was the war song. That was the battle song. As these coming out of 1857 into a time where their lives were literally being, being laid down, but so much had developed within so many of them a heart for principle, a heart for freedom, a heart for justice, that they literally now had been able to become something that many of them had not ever become before. I'm not saying that all of the Union troops were, were Sunday school attending, Bible quoting, you know, baptized Christians, but I am saying that there was something that happened in 1857 that did not happen in the southern tier of states, where there was a determination to protect slavery at all costs, even if we have to die for it. There was on the north, coming out of the 1857 prayer revival, this Jesus setting folks free and putting within them a call to a sense of what is right, and you do it as under the Lord, willing to die that men may be made free. I, 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 give, you, I give you those brief illustrations in order for us to Lay hold of this truth, folks. Listen, listen. You are important. You are important in what's going on in the nation right now. You are important as to the healing that the Lord is going to bring to the United States of America. And you're important from the standpoint of realizing that my name may not be on in any article in, in the New York Times. Nobody may know my name in the in the Washington in the in the, in the in the D.C. Senate or even in Austin or wherever. I'm not known out there. But Lord, some way somehow, by your providential love for me, you know my name. You called me out of darkness and into your marvelous light, and you've allowed me to live at this time. In the history of the world, I'm here. I've got a street address. I've got a car that'll drive down roads. I'm on this earth. I'm not in heaven yet. And I must be here because you were wanting me to be in agreement with your heart for the United States of America. 
and I assume and I accept and I receive that call upon my life that I'm on this earth, that I may be in agreement with your will, with your heart to be done on this earth. Don't, don't insult the Lord's grace. Don't insult the Lord's mercy towards you and his desire for you by acting as if I'm not a, I'm not a player in this. That there's nothing, there's nothing significant about my life that, that I could weigh in on the battle for the soul of my nation and make any difference. That is something exactly that, that the enemy wants you to believe. How, 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 big, how big does the person have to be? I'm, I'm, I'm stepping off into some of my background here. Y'all have to forgive me, ladies. You got to forgive me. But how big a person do you have to be to pull a trigger on a high-powered weapon? Is it? And then, hang on, don't, don't, don't lose, don't walk off with, don't, 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 don't bury your head. The, the, the point is not how big the person is with the trigger finger. The point is how strong is the weapon. How strong is the weapon when it's released? I'm saying to some grandmothers, I'm saying to some some ladies and some men maybe who may just be short in stature, not very very strong physically, maybe in and out of medical conditions, but because you are a son or a daughter of the Most High God, because Jesus is alive in your heart, and Jesus has said to you, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it, and you are willing to pull the trigger on that request, Lord, heal our land, rescue our land, forgive me, forgive us, bring your mercy to this place. It, it's not about how big we are, it's a matter of how awesome he is. And I'm saying to you, the hope for the nation is not that the American Christians pick up knives and sabers and, and, and grenade launchers and, 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 and try to do something in the physical. The battle is not in the physical realm as we've been taught. It's in the spiritual realm. And when you understand that, that the Lord will allow circumstances to happen. He, he doesn't stop them. He allows them to come for the purpose of causing us to be freshly pressed to seek his face. The, the, the more that the church just takes it and backs up and, and, and just tries to duck it and ignore, then the enemy gains ground. But here's the word. When you hear this call to your heart, stand up. Stand up. Speak up. Name my name with honor. And you pray, you pray knowing that you are heard in heaven. And it's not a matter of if it's going to happen down here. It's just a matter of when God's providential time is for it to happen. I'm so greatly encouraged by the reports that I get regularly. And I try to keep up with, the, with as many as I can of how this, this awakening within the church to cry out from our place in the Father's heart for the rescue of America is spreading. I believe that there are perhaps more American true Christians seeking the face of the Lord for the rescue of our nation than maybe have ever been in operation since I've been alive. And I'm 68. And have seen things. I've seen the Lord do things in answer to prayer in the Jesus Revolution in, in the late 60s, early 70s. And, and, and you know, many of you were alive in those days. Nixon, the, the, the Nixon shame. The, the, the Martin Luther King murder. The, the two Kennedy brother murders. Vietnam, where friends of ours, many of you were actually drafted and sent there and, 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 and came back changed forever. You might have been physically the same, but what you saw is what you went through. But oh goodness, in the middle of those days, and when the nation was, was being pressed and many, many afraid, can, can, this, can this American experience experiment survive this, this great trauma? But in the middle of that, the Lord was stirring his people to pray, 
stirring his people to pray God. It's not a politician. It's not a matter of money. It, 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 it's not anything but you. We need you. We humble ourselves before you, confessing our sins. Lord, have mercy on this nation. Have mercy on this nation. Broke out in California on the West Coast. Busted loose in a Bible college on the East Coast, Asbury College. There began to be gatherings of thousands of young people, college-age students, gathering all over the nation. In Houston, where we were at that time, the, 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 the announcement came that, that this group, this whole band that had just gotten saved, come to know the Lord in Vegas, was going to be they called Love Song. They changed the name to Love Song. I don't know what they were before. But they ended up in Houston on the University of Houston campus, and, and the, you know, I, I was there along with several thousand other, other kids just to, just to listen to what, what is this? What is this? There was life, and there was joy, and there was freedom, and there was power in their testimony. And they, they, they sang, and they played the drums. A drummer broke about six sticks and was throwing those things all over the place. I thought, how in the world is anything spiritual about this? I'd grown up. As a, you know, as a Baptist preacher's kid, we didn't, have a, we didn't have a drum within 40 miles of the church. And here's this guy just going nuts. But when they gave the testimony, I was in darkness, but Jesus brought me into the light. I didn't have hope, but Jesus has been the answer for my life. I, and, and, I mean, and, and there were thousands in that room on those occasions. Andre Crouch. The, the, the great black saint, he, nobody knew him back then, but the Lord refreshed his heart through it all, through it all, through it all, he said, I've, I've learned to trust in Jesus, I've learned to trust in God. So don't you sit out there and tell me it can't happen. Don't, 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 don't say there's no hope for America, there's only no hope for, for America if the church will just cower down and give up. But when we understand that we're here by his design for this time. The Lord didn't make a mistake when he caused us to be birthed at this time, knowing these things that are coming. He's put stuff in our hearts leading into this that he will prove to be true and powerful in these days. Amen. 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 So, so how does the Lord... How does God heal a broken nation? The first thing is he often uses difficult circumstances to awaken his people. All right? The second thing is this. He will convict his people of personal and national sin. He will convict us. That, that's, what, that's what 2 Chronicles 7 is talking about. If my people call by my name, humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. That, that, that this matter of, of coming before the Lord, I'm, I'm needing to, to understand that how David put it, that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I can pray all day. I can make all kinds of requests. But if there's something in my heart that I'm not willing to give, let go of and give to the Lord, then the Lord has the right not to even hear my prayer. But where there is a turning to him and there's a releasing, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's his heart to do. But it's also about the national sins, about the national sins. And here, I'm going to drop this in, and, and I want you to think about it. There is somebody who lives inside you. There is somebody, and his name is Jesus who has brought his mind into your mind, has brought his emotions into your emotions, has, has, has brought, he has come himself to live inside you. One of the things that, that Ezekiel will say is that the day will come when the law of God will not be out there in books or in scrolls. But he says, the Lord says, I will write my law across your hearts. You can leave your Bible in the other room, but his law, what pleases him, what delights him, he has written across your heart by the Spirit of Jesus who's alive in you. So, so, when you 
get some news, when you happen to sit down to try to catch the 6 o'clock news just to get the weather. But here they come. Here come the reports. Here come the assessments. Here come the prognostications. Here come all that stuff. And one after another, you find yourself as those words are spoken and those declarations are made in your heart. You know that's not God. That's not the heart of God. That's wrong. That's wrong. And the way of the transgressor is hard. Leadership of the nation, you keep taking us in that way. And you're going to take us in a hard way. It won't get better. It will get worse. And something in your spirit resonates with that. Who is that? What is that? Who is that? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Who is in you, whom you have from God, you're not of your own, been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body and your spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Our bodies are the temple of the Spirit. Therefore, we will hear the registry of Holy Spirit inside our lives. So that it's not here. Where I'm starting to say is, when you hear that and you are offended by that, you are hurt by that. There's a sense of, that is so wrong, I can't believe anybody's saying it. For you as a child of God to understand, that's not just you reacting. That's the Spirit of Jesus inside you reacting. When we hear stuff, and it's diametrically opposed to the heart of God, and something goes off in us that grieves us, we are to understand That my spirit is linked with his spirit. And so from that place, to confess it, Lord, that's wrong. Instead of just sitting there taking it, well, you know, things have just changed. It's a different age. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That for us to recognize and to embrace that the Lord will let us be the depository of his presence and that out from us will come his reaction. His reaction. It's not just you by your little old self being offended by this, that, or the other, but where there is a sense in your heart that's against what God's heart is. That's against what his law, his rule, his teaching, his way is. It is a big deal. Because it's not just you, it's the Spirit of Jesus alive in you. But but Jesus came as the Savior of the world, absolutely. Absolutely. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when we hear things being said by people, we are to understand that that people right there is someone whom the Lord loves. And the Lord's not willing that any should perish. That one right there, speaking those things, we pray, Lord, will you rescue them? But we also understand that behind that person, standing back here behind that person, pulling the puppet strings and the mouth and the mind and the thoughts of that person doing all the talking is something other, none other than, than the forces of darkness, Satan. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit of this age, operating in the sun's of disobedience. They're operating the sons of disobedience. So, so when we are offended, we separate. I can still care about that person and pray for that person and pray for truth to come for that person. But I'm, I'm, I am saying to you, Lord, that is Satan saying that. That is not your heart. That is not truth. That is wrong in the sight of God. And I renounce it and, and I confess it as sin where, far is it, where it's been agreed within this nation. I renounce it. I confess it. I won't stand for it. Now, I, I talked to my mother a, a minute ago, my 90-something-year-old who has the heart and mind of a 16-year-old, 18-year-old, bright, alive. She said, David, she normally watches this early service. Something happened on the computer and she didn't get to it, so we, but we talk in between services. If she says, that wasn't a real, I don't know what you were talking about this morning, son. I know I better redo my notes, you know. 
But if she was blessed, then which hopefully most of the time she is, I, I, I know we're on to something. And, but, but she said, she said I, I, can, I have a hard time listening to this news. I have a hard time letting all it, because it can be so discouraging. It can cause me, and, and, and she's walked with the Lord for a long, 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 long time. But the effect the enemy can have on all of us is to push us back so that we don't stay in the fray in the place of prayer. We, we just get back and we just look about other things. Where they, but when it is the Lord showing us, I have you here by my design. And my heart, my mind, my spirit is alive in you. You agree with me and you renounce the lies of the enemy. Here's something I believe has happened in recently in our generation. It is that there seems to be more of a satanic more of a diabolical uh, movement in, in cultures around the world, ours in particular, than maybe th they may have ever been. Why? The power of life and death are in the tongue, the Scripture says. That there, through the social media, everybody has a voice. You can either write it or you can speak it. But if the writing and the speaking of those words that now have legs, that they don't, they don't have life if they just stay in your brain. But the minute you write it, the minute you make it public, the minute you speak it, it has life. The power of life or of death in the tongue. We have so many billions of spoken words, and so many of them are contrary to the heart of God and the will of God, that it can seem as if, in, from, in an invisible but very real way, we're being knocked back, knocked back, knocked back by all of the power of the words. That's why it can be so vitally important for us as the Lord's people to spend time in this Word, to, 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 to spend time with the, with the Internet turned off, with the TV turned off, with the radio turned off, get in a God-made world, get quiet, get silent. If Jesus had to do it so many times that there would be times they couldn't even find Him, they didn't even know where he was. Have you seen him? I don't know. I don't know where he is. They had no GPS. They had no cell phones. They just had to wait until he showed back up. It's an, if he needed it, brother, you need it. Sister, you and I need that. That time alone, that time quiet, Lord, speak to me. And I want to be found in agreement with you. You see, here's, here's something else I just need to say. This is important. That when there is the, the sense of the life of Jesus alive in you, giving you a registry from within of what is wrong in his sight and what is right in his sight, then it, we're also reminded that all of the Bible is true. All of the scripture is true. And which means that we have to own as our own, we have to hold this. That it's not just that the Lord desires to bless, but it's that the one who has the power to bless also has the power to punish, also has the power to curse. If it is the spiritual in charge of the physical, if the invisible is in charge of the visible, and this principle is true, just as we rejoice in the visible rain that comes from a gracious heart. As that Second Chronicles 7 says, the Lord is saying, if I cause it not to rain, if I, shut, if I shut the heavens, I the invisible, shut the visible. But if my people who are called by my name, being, being the victim of those things that are now being withheld, if they'll humble themselves and pray and turn from wicked ways, I'll hear from them and forgive their sins. And here come the rains again. But the power of sin to withhold the blessings of God, that's someone who knows Jesus in your heart. You know that's true. It's not that he, he delights in making us miserable, but there are consequences to the choices that we make when we choose away from God. This is, this is Isaiah, the book of Isaiah chapter 5. Let me read some of these verses to us. The prophet writes, Isaiah 5, verse 1, Let me sing now for my well-beloved, 
a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill, and he dug it all around and removed its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. Skip a little bit. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. And this is a striking statement. I want you to see this. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall, and it will become trampled ground, and I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it. And then he says, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but instead, behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. Look at verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good, and good evil. Who substitute darkness for light, and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Verse 24, therefore as a tongue of fire consumes stubble and dry grass collapses the flame, collapses into flame, so their root will become like rot and their blossom blow away like dust, for they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. But where is the word of the Lord written in you? Where where is the law of the Lord recorded? It may not be recorded in every American in the heart, but child of God, my brother, my sister, the law of the Lord, that which pleases the Lord, that which has become that which you and I desire more than desiring our old way and the former things, but that that longing for the Lord to be pleased, His name to be honored, that's written across our hearts. But this is saying, this vine, like unto Israel, the Lord has the capacity, just as He has had the ability to bless America, just as He has had the, the, the ability to prosper us in so many ways, that he also has the ability, and, and this is the statement, to, to, to cause the hedge, the hedge or the wall to be removed. It's not that he has to do anything. It's just that he can lift his hedge of protection. And then we're vulnerable. But he's always looked for a remnant. And that's the, the joy we have today, that there may not be every American in every church that will hear this, but there are millions who are hearing it. Lord, we renounce agreement with the lies of darkness. We renounce agreement with the enemy in any and every way. We cry out to you for cleansing, for mercy, for the change in our hearts, and we embrace your call, the Lord Jesus Christ, upon our lives as we live here in this land. Now, I've got to end part two, Lord willing, will be next week, so I hope you'll, you'll at least give me a shot next week to finish this. But I want to read you something. What, what, what does it mean? What does it mean to confess? To confess our personal sins and our national sins. Now, just bear with me i got to put my glasses on because that's real small type here. This resolution, 
in the United States Senate adopted on March the 2nd, 1863 by the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. Whereas the Senate of the United States, just government of Almighty God, in all motion, requested the requested the president to designate and set apart a day for national prayer and humiliation. Now keep in mind, years, starting and trying announced in the Holy Scripture. Justly, of civil war. I've been the peace and prosperity, numbers, wealth. And us, and we have hearts. We have become too self sufficient of redeeming and preserving. It behooves us then offended power. Occurring in the views of the designate and set apart 1863 as prayer. Staying on that day from their order tonight at their several. Proper to that other world. As an experiment, honored, repent. More left to be done and is done. to this reconciliation and free and by the grace of God. I ask you to join me in closing wherever you are. I ask you, invite your head publicly. We humble ourselves. We take the thank you for laying. We are not. We can lift up. You see the place we can for well in this setting we know and when we hear of them, see them, hear hear them on the news, we, we realize that's wrong. That's wrong.